Growing up, many of our friends lived in the same neighborhood as us. We all played together until the sun went down and the streetlights came on. Unfortunately for Elizabeth Olton's family, when the sun went down on October 21st, 2009, Elizabeth didn't return home. Follow us on a journey of nature versus nurture as we discover what happened to the young nine-year-old and why she was murdered just a week before Halloween. It was a week like any other in St. Martin's, Missouri, a small town with just over a thousand people. The houses were decorated with Halloween witches, goblins, and jack-o'-lanterns. Elizabeth Olton traveled home from Trail Elementary School on the bus with her best friend, Taylor Heidbretter, waving goodbye as she got off at her stop. Little did her friend know that was the last time she would ever see her. In an interview, Taylor reminisced on Elizabeth's final words to her. Happy birthday, Taylor, and then got off the bus. Elizabeth was like many nine-year-old girls. She enjoyed being social with others and preferred girly things. She loved cats and the color pink. Her mother, Patty Press, was raising Elizabeth and her siblings alone ever since Elizabeth's father, Dale Olton, was sent to jail on a state fiction. A family friend described her as, she was somebody special. They called her a girly girl. She would be outside in the snow or in the mud in her frilly little dress. It was like any other Wednesday night. Patty was getting ready to make dinner as Elizabeth practiced her lines for a play she was going to be in, entertaining her brother Anthony when there was a knock at the door. Elizabeth's six-year-old friend from down the street, Emma, was at the door asking her to come out and play. Originally, her mother told her she wasn't allowed to go out, but then she claimed, both girls were hopping up and down, begging, wanting to play, so I was like, okay, you can go for an hour. But she had to be home by six. As nighttime came, Elizabeth's mother became extremely worried when she didn't return home. Elizabeth was known to be terrified of the dark, so her mother called Emma's grandparents to see if she was there. When Emma's grandmother, Karen Brooke, answered the phone, she told Patty that she hadn't seen Elizabeth at all that day. Patty instantly became worried, as she knew her daughter was terrified of the dark and would not be okay in the dense forest alone. Patty immediately called the police, and the Cole County Sheriff's Department was on the scene in 15 minutes. Both the police and Patty went over to Emma's house, the last known whereabouts of Elizabeth. Everybody up there said she wasn't there. Uh, so then they started doing a search. They called in the fire department and local officers. And by 10 o'clock, there was probably hundreds of people looking for her. They formed a grid search around Patty's home and throughout the neighborhood. However, as the night continued, they found no evidence of foul play but her mother knew she wouldn't just vanish. She attempted to call Elizabeth's cell phone multiple times, but it repeatedly went to voicemail. The police decided to contact the cell phone company and order an emergency ping to figure out where the phone was. When the cell phones are used, they send out a ping to the nearest cell tower. The emergency ping would do just that and hopefully provide information on Elizabeth's location. They received three pings before the phone went dead, and the police were able to track it to the dense forest between Elizabeth and Emma's homes. Sergeant David Rice, who was the lead officer on the case, stated, The pings from the phone all were located in the general area of the woods. It was a large wooded area behind the house, but it's, it's thick forest ground, and it was a lot of area to cover. He was still in the area, had been grabbed perhaps by a kidnapper or a child. Um, so we were also pursuing the, the possibility that maybe somebody grabbed her and put her in a car. A missing persons report was sent out to several law enforcement agencies, including the FBI. Over 300 community volunteers and three separate law enforcement agencies were involved in the search for the little girl. Elizabeth's sister, Stephanie, was shocked by the number of people coming out to support her family. They were using planes, helicopters, dogs, and diving teams to search for Elizabeth. Officers also reached out to all 
was in the area to ensure none of them had taken the little girl. By Thursday afternoon, almost 24 hours later, Sergeant Rice returned to Emma's home, the last place Elizabeth had been, to ask the family more questions. In an interview, Sergeant Rice mentioned, Emma was interviewed by the FBI and Emma simply stated that she was playing with her friend Elizabeth and about an hour later, Elizabeth started walking home and that was the last she saw of her. However, later that evening, Emma began changing her story. She claimed she was outside playing with Elizabeth, then shortly after she got stuck in some thorn bushes and began screaming for her sister Alyssa to come and get her out. Alyssa Bustamante was Emma's 15-year-old half-sister. She grew up in a toxic household with addicted parents who had her when they were just teenagers themselves. Her father, Cesar Bustamante, was serving in jail three concurrent prison terms for felony as assault, and her mother, Michelle Bustamante, often struggled to pay rent and had three misdemeanor criminal convictions, including drunk driving and possession. In 2002, Alyssa's maternal grandparents took Alyssa and her three siblings in as their own and became their legal guardians. Without any knowledge of the first eight years of her life, it became quite obvious that her behavior as a teen was due to her upbringing. She had trouble with depression and was regularly seeing a psychiatrist for her self-harming tendencies. She had been known to discuss the idea of what killing someone felt like with her friends and with her boyfriend, Dustin. In one of Dustin's eight police interrogations, he claimed that she brought up the idea with him. She asked you that? He then went on to describe her as emo when the officer questioned why this didn't seem out of the ordinary. She's emo, so the emos think about that kind of stuff. Who's emo? Emos are people who like to and think Alyssa also liked to share a lot of her dark thoughts on social media. She posted several photos of her covered in fake blood and looking sinister. In her online bios, she described her hobbies as killing people and cutting. She also used to enjoy putting her siblings in danger, including one time when she made one of her younger twin brothers touch an electrified fence and then posted it on YouTube. In Alyssa's original interview with authorities, they found her to be calm and did not consider her a suspect. However, during one of the searches in the forest with community volunteers and Alyssa, the FBI had come across a large hole in the ground. At that point, Sergeant Rice overheard her tell officers, She dug the hole. He asked her why she dug it and she claimed, I just like digging holes and would bury dead animals when she found them. This prompted Sergeant Rice to have the hole inspected and obtain consent for the search of Alyssa's home. The hole was inspected and no human remains were found. However, plenty of evidence was discovered in Alyssa's bedroom, including muddy clothes, disturbing drawings on the walls, and her diary. Inside her diary, they found her final entry that would ultimately be her demise. On the day of Elizabeth's disappearance, she had written a paragraph and then scribbled it out in blue ink. In her mind, she thought it was gone forever since she had scribbled pen across it. In her interrogation, she remained calm as Sergeant Rice asked her about the details of that day and where she had been that afternoon. She began the interview denying all possibility that she took part in the crime. Her grandmother, Karen, joined her in the interrogation room fully believing that Alyssa was innocent. She mentioned that she came home on the bus at around 3 or 4 p.m. Wow. And then I went for a walk around by, just walking around in the forest for a while. And I was supposed to take my little sister with me, but I ditched her because she's annoying. Then she said she came home around 5.36ish and heard yelling outside. Emma was apparently stuck in the thorn bushes and asking her to get her out. And she asked me, why I was waiting 
because you know, the other one period. They're like, yeah, don't tell anyone that. She went on to say that her brother and Emma were asking if she had seen Elizabeth because she was supposed to have arrived home at that point. She didn't mention what exactly her response was to that question, but she said she didn't think much of it at the time as the three of them went inside to hang out before church. And then when we came back, there was three shared cars in our property where there was people out searching everywhere. Uh -huh. That's pretty much it. I want to sleep back in. The entire time during her interview, she can be seen nodding her head, either consciously or subconsciously, which suggested she was trying to convince Sergeant Rice of her version of events. When she was done explaining her version of events, she said, that's pretty much it. This sentence is known as an exclusion qualifier. According to CIA agents, it's a tactic that allows people to withhold certain information while still answering a question truthfully. Her body language began to clearly show she was lying about the exact events that took place. Between her use of the word, um, her constant shrugging of one shoulder and the nodding of her head, these identifiers proved that she was hiding something. When Sergeant Rice asked her to repeat the events of her day, she confessed that she did see Elizabeth that afternoon. Half an hour into her interview, Sergeant Rice asked Alyssa, What do you think happened to Elizabeth? I really don't think she would run away because she's not in the way that they've been searching for two days, never had any sign of her. So I, I think that maybe someone it is important to note that innocent individuals are much more likely to say that they have no idea what happened to the victim, whereas guilty individuals feel like they need to give an explanation that doesn't fit with the crime they have committed. About an hour into her interrogation, Alyssa was asked what items were taken from her room during the search. Did they, did they find anything? Nope. Okay, did they take anything? Um, they took my sheet and a pillowcase. So oh, they took a pair of hands okay. and a diary. At that point in the interview, Alyssa's face was clearly showing a state of shock. She had no idea that they took her diary, and when asked about whether she felt upset that they read it, she responded with, Did you know that? No. Does it make you angry? Yeah. Inside the diary, investigators found many disturbing thoughts, including Alyssa's desire to burn a house down with a family inside, and her attempt at in 2007. Uh, that referred to burning down a house and killing the people in it. The most damning evidence was the scribbled out entry from Wednesday, October 21st. In the diary, Alyssa wrote about the euphoria she felt while taking someone's life. I just killed someone. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, LOL. Sergeant Rice was fully aware of the confession in the diary and took this moment to catch Alyssa off guard. Even if you write something down, yeah, it doesn't matter, let's say you write it down in pencil. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it go away. Just before Alyssa confessed to the crime, juvenile officer Toby Myers made a critical mistake by involving herself in the questioning. What? We deal with kids all the time. We deal with kids all the time. That's all of them. She was supposed to be Alyssa's advocate, and because of this happening, the confession was later deemed unusable as evidence in the prosecution of Alyssa Bustamante. Sergeant Rice then told Alyssa that if the death of Elizabeth was an accident, it's fine, but they need to know the truth. We have to know the truth. That's all I'm asking for, is whatever happened. I have to know the truth. Alyssa finally stated, It was an accident. We were just mentioned she fell. She died. I didn't know what to do. So I burned her body. She claimed she did it by the creek bed and scattered most of the ashes into the water. She said this so investigators would assume the body was gone and not go looking for the remains. 
since they would tell the truth of Elizabeth's death. However, Alyssa was unaware of just how difficult it is to burn a body and eventually claimed she dug a hole to bury the rest of Elizabeth's remains. Sergeant Rice continued to pressure Alyssa into telling the full truth, repeatedly asking her, How did she die? Nine-year-old girls don't just die. Was her throat cut? We were messing her out, but she fell back and hit her head. Yeah. Oh. At this point in the interview, Alyssa's grandmother began breaking down. She had just realized that her 15-year-old granddaughter just admitted to murdering a nine-year-old girl. With much hesitation to admitting the truth, Alyssa eventually confessed. I think you dug the hole ahead of time. Okay, Friday. Is that what happened? Yes. Did she afterwards? Or where? Many times, Sergeant Rice tried to get Alyssa to confess to who may have helped her. Uh, who helped you? No. Grandpa helped you, didn't he? No. It was also mentioned in Dustin's interview that he may have known she had help when he slipped up and said, All that I know is what the FBI told me. They told me that she buried him and then throws. She already had a, a hook dug for him. They buried her. She wasn't big enough, so then they buried her. At that point, the investigator said, They buried her again? To which Dustin replied, I mean, and then the investigator said, who's they? I mean... Alyssa. The investigator responds with, Dustin, who's they? Dustin then shrugged and replied, I didn't mean they, it's just what I've been saying over the last couple days, cause I just couldn't see Alyssa doing that by herself. However, no one else was ever charged with helping Alyssa. It was mentioned that the reason for her digging two graves was because she originally planned on killing her twin brothers, but that idea was never corroborated with evidence. The following day of the murder, on October 22nd, Alyssa skipped school and Dustin stayed home sick. She went over to his house and they hung out all day. Many people believe Dustin knew more than he was letting on. When his mother arrived home unexpectedly around 1 p.m., he pushed her into a closet to hide and gave her a change of clothes for unknown reasons. He told police that when his mother was in the shower, she confessed to killing the girl, and he told her to go home. However, Alyssa claimed she never told Dustin anything about the murder that day. It's not really the kind of thing that you tell people. Sergeant Rice later announced the full line of events that took place. She said she sent Emma, her sister, over to the Olden household to pick Elizabeth up. From that point, she claimed that she told Emma to go back home and that she took Elizabeth by the hand and walked her into the woods. Alyssa then told Elizabeth that she had something to show her, and it was a little bit further ahead. She was armed with a kitchen knife and led Elizabeth to her death. After Alyssa's confession, she agreed to take Sergeant Rice to Elizabeth's body. She knew exactly you know, where it was, led us directly to it. Was it well covered? It was not well covered. Once she pointed out the area and you looked a little bit closer, you could see that she was only a few, you know, a, a few inches, if that, under the ground and you could see body parts. It was a pretty horrifying homicide. During the walkthrough of the crime scene, Alyssa described in detail how Elizabeth was facing her when she s***ed her. her. Okay. And then her chest area. Her chest area? Yeah. In the front or in the back? Front. Dragged her into the hole. Pulled her body into the grave and buried her. Chillingly, Sergeant Rice asked her if she was in this hole, to which Alyssa replied with, This is the hole over here. She's in her, how deep is that hole? It's not very deep. When Elizabeth's body was found, her family addressed the media with a statement. Our family was deeply saddened this afternoon to hear about her passing. We would like the community to know that we are grateful for all your thoughts and prayers. Once Elizabeth's autopsy was complete, it matched Alyssa's entry in her diary. Mark Richardson, the prosecuting attorney in the case, stated, this was very premeditated by the 15-year-old murderer. She had dug the grave holes at least five days in advance of the murder. And it was premeditated in the sense that she sent her sister down to get Elizabeth out of the house for the purpose of murdering her.
homicide met the legal requirements for first-degree murder, however, Alyssa was only 15 at the time. She was certified to stand trial as an adult, and on November 17, 2009, a grand jury indicted her on two counts of murder in the first degree and armed criminal action. At the same time, the U.S. Supreme Court was making a decision to end life sentences without the possibility of parole for juveniles, as they decided it was unconstitutional. Prosecutors then offered up a plea deal to the defense, an amendment to the murder in second degree, with a range of 10 to 30 years, or life imprisonment with the chance of parole. Her defense claimed that one of the reasons she committed the crime was because she was under the influence of Prozac which she had recently started receiving a higher dosage of, and that could have made her act in a more unpredictable manner. And Prozac made her more prone to violence. They say she had suffered from depression for years and once attempted by overdosing on painkillers. Elizabeth's mother commented, I was mad. I was very mad. Alyssa's defense team accepted the plea deal, and during the sentencing phase, she addressed her victim's family and stated, I cannot even understand what you guys are going through. I'm sorry for that. If I could give my life to bring her back, I would. And I'm sorry. After the hearing, Elizabeth's sister claimed, I don't think she can be sorry. I don't believe anything, she says. And her mother said, She was being fed what to say to us from her attorney, so none of it was real. After days of emotional testimony in court, Alyssa finally broke down in tears for the first time during the two years of court proceedings. For most of the trial, Alyssa stared at the floor with zero expression on her face, including when her grandparents broke down and stormed out of the courtroom. When the judge announced that he would sentence Alyssa the next day, Elizabeth's grandmother yelled, I think Alyssa should get out of jail the same day Elizabeth gets out of the grave. In January of 2012, Alyssa was charged with life imprisonment and a chance at parole after 35 and a half years. She applied for an appeal against the sentence, but was denied in March 2014. She was seen by several mental health professionals who all testified that she suffered from major depressive disorder and borderline personality disorder. Major depressive disorder, more easily known as depression, is a mental disorder that causes people to experience low mood, low self-esteem, loss of interest or excitement in enjoyable activities, and may also cause delusions or hallucinations. A borderline personality disorder is characterized by a pattern of unstable relationships, emotional reactions, and self-harm. People with BPD also struggle with the feeling of emptiness, fear of abandonment, and are often detached from reality. Not every person diagnosed with these illnesses is prone to crime. However, many criminals are found to have mental health issues from trauma in their past. The day after the murder, Alyssa contacted her psychiatrist to tell them she was under an intense amount of stress from the police searching for clues of Elizabeth's disappearance in her house. Leading up to the killing, they assessed Alyssa and were concerned about her spiraling depression and thoughts of ending her life, as well as her increasingly bad behavior. They initially said they had no concern about Alyssa's involvement in Elizabeth's disappearance since she was more likely to hurt herself than others, but they also claimed they could be wrong. Her friends from school wanted people to know that no one saw this coming from a girl who is nice to everyone, but severely depressed. When asked whether she deserves parole, many people spoke out in disagreement. Her childhood best friend said, I don't think there is anywhere that she should be besides prison ever because you just can't get away with something like that. Elizabeth's sister, Stephanie said, I hate her, that she's ruined everyone in my family's life. And her mother, Patty said, She changed everybody's life. So drastically. It's not fair. She should be sent in prison. She should die too. I don't care how old she was. Age didn't have anything to do with it. There's no rehabilitation for her. On Wednesday, October 28th, 2009, Elizabeth received the beautiful funeral she deserved with a pink casket and a horse drawn carriage. All the attendees also wore pink t shirts that said, our precious angel, to commemorate the beautiful little girl. When a family spokesperson was interviewed by the media, she said, I'm afraid that she will be forgotten, 
and we don't want that. We want to remember her. We want to remember the, the little girl with the smile that played, that was a happy, normal child, that was important to our world, that's gone, and we don't want her forgotten, and that's what matters to us. And this is paying tribute to her memory and who she was. When she was asked about what the family thought of the reactions around Alyssa's clothing and education requirements while in prison, she said, He said today is simply all about Elizabeth. In 2010, Elizabeth's father, Dale Olton, was interviewed in prison where he said, I hope justice is served. I really do, because it's not right. She was innocent. She didn't do nothing. She deserved to be killed the way she was killed. She didn't have a chance at life. He then went on to describe her relationship with her. I mean, it was good. I mean, it's, you know, I, mean, I believe it was, I mean, there was a lot of love there. I'd show up. It was all hugs and holding each other and such like that. It just, it was harder to leave than it was to get there. Like I said, she was my bug. She was my heart. When asked what he thought about Alyssa's desire to kill out of curiosity of what it felt like, he said, As a father, I think she ought to feel how it feels to die. Go through what my daughter did. I have her picture on my wall, okay? Every time I, I look up at it, I, I want to cry. I get mad, I get angry, I feel sorry. Every night I tell her I love her, and I'm sorry I wasn't there to protect her. Every single night, okay? I just wish that it never happened. I wish I was there to protect her. Patty sued Alyssa for damages in a wrongful death suit in October 2015 and agreed to a settlement of $5 million in 2017. Alyssa is serving her sentence at the Women's Eastern Missouri Reception, Diagnostic, and Correctional Center in Vandalia. There is a rumor that Alyssa may possibly be released from jail after serving only 15 years because of a repeal law. The National Organization of Juvenile Murderers started a petition on behalf of Elizabeth's family. Alyssa will be eligible for parole in July 2027 because of Senate Bill 26, which was approved in 2021. When a state representative was asked about the parole changes, he said, I'm not sure the parole board is very anxious to set a parole hearing for her and give her that leniency because she didn't give that nine-year-old girl that leniency. They claim the bill is intended for inmates like Bobby Bostick, who received a 241-year sentence for robbery in St. Louis when he was 16. The bill says people convicted of first-degree murder wouldn't qualify, but Bustamante pleaded guilty instead to second-degree murder. It is my personal belief she should have received murder one, uh, and this language wasn't intended for people like her. Ultimately, it will be up to the parole board to set the hearing. Over the years, Alyssa has gained several cult-like followers, including fan pages on social media and groups titled Free Alyssa Bustamante. Many of these accounts have also made artwork of her and are actual profiles using her photos and pretending to be her. Many believe she was so traumatized by her parents that something like this was inevitable. Others believe she is a sociopath who knew exactly what she was doing and found a thrill in it. When her grandfather was interviewed about her mood the night of the murder, he said, The night Alyssa killed Elizabeth, she seemed to be in an unusually good mood. One of her fellow inmates said, I was in prison with Alyssa and got to know her quite well. She is actually an incredibly sweet girl, and by talking to her, you'd never imagine her being able to kill someone. She's in a lot of programs in there and truly feels remorseful for what she has done. Now she is just another teen girl murdering along with the infamous teen killers like Diana Zamora, who killed Adrian Jones in 1995 at the age of 17, 16-year-old Collie Killers, who s and s their victim in 2006, Brenda Spencer, who killed two adults and injured eight children, plus a cop in 1979, and of course, Mary Bell who killed two toddlers at the young age of 11. We may never know the true reason behind Elizabeth's unfortunate death, whether Alyssa killed her because she was raised in a toxic household or simply because she was an evil person. Let us know in the comments what you think about this crime. Does Alyssa deserve to get out of jail in 2027 after serving just 15 years of her sentence? What are your thoughts on nature versus nurture?
Don't forget to click that notification bell, like this video, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time!